Of course, KTLA just didn't throw a switch and decide to go on the air that January evening in 1947. In a way, you could say that KTLA got its start at the infamous 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. Working on the experimental telecast of those games was a 20-year-old German lad who was already recognized as an electronic genius. His name was Klaus Landsberg. It didn't take very long for young Klaus to realize that Hitler and the Nazis were not for him. And when the 36 games were over, Landsberg immigrated to America. By 1939, Landsberg was helping NBC to put together that first major demonstration of television at the New York Fair. And just two years later, Klaus was hired by Paramount Pictures to set up its first experimental television station in Los Angeles. Armed with a suitcase full of electronic nuts and bolts, Landsberg came to California and began to establish the experimental TV station called W6XYZ. Within a year of his arrival, W6XYZ was on the air, sending out amazingly clear pictures to the handful of TV sets in the area. On its two nights a week of broadcasting, Landsberg showed his viewers the comic strips on a show called Telephonies. He showed the news with film slides. He presented Hollywood features. A great believer in public affairs as well as pure entertainment, Landsberg also programmed a kind of town meeting of the air, which dealt with matters of public controversy. On September 5th, 1946, the matter at hand was, do we or don't we want the Hollywood freeway? At times, it seems that that answer is still in doubt. And how about a little Landsberg invention called shopping at home? Here's the format. Household items were shown on the screen, and then a phone number was shown. You called in and ordered the item. Sound familiar? Some 40 years later, that concept has returned to become one of today's hottest TV formats. One who remembers those hectic days is Eddie Resnick, who shot camera at KTLA for almost 30 years. And I went and I saw Landsberg, and I said, what am I going to do? He says, well, we only got three people as a whole station, two engineers and himself. He says, oh, you clean up the floor, you'll get props, you know, whatever, you, whatever is helpful. Without a pause, Landsberg was hard at work providing TV viewers with programs that might seem a bit old-fashioned today, but at the time were innovative, creative, and surely the state of the art in the 1940s. Oh, now the stage was set for the beginnings of the most innovative, creative, and competitive television market in the world. As soon as Channel 2 signed on in 1948, Klaus Landsberg was ready for the challenge. Since Channel 2's main emphasis in those days was sports, Landsberg decided to aim his black and white cameras at something different, music and variety shows. I'm Hal Fishman, Channel 5 News. In this segment of our anniversary salute to Los Angeles television, we are going to look at the subject that it seems television was invented for, the coverage of news. We've talked a lot on this program about Klaus Landsberg, but nothing he ever did compares with the miracle he accomplished in bringing the first live coverage of an atomic test to the American people. Just 18 days before the test was scheduled, the Atomic Energy Commission decided to allow live TV coverage of the test. All three networks wanted desperately to carry the test, but they knew the time frame made it all but impossible. At that time, the telephone company carried most TV signals over its lines or microwave relays. A call to the telephone company just about dashed any remaining hopes. Sure, they said, we can do it. Give us about eight weeks to set up the relays across the desert, and about $70,000 in expenses, and we'll get you a beautiful picture. But the test was now just 16 days away. Finally, someone decided in desperation to call on television's technical genius, Klaus Landsberg. Well, said Klaus, I'll uh, give it a try. And with Grant Holcomb of CBS as the anchor man, the nation saw its first live explosion of an atomic bomb. Three, three, two, 33, one, one, zero. Well, there it is. The first public demonstration in the biggest continental atomic detonation in the history of the world. Ten days later, another test was held, and with the equipment still in place, KTLA also covered that one live. Reporting was KTLA's own news director, Gil Martin. 
17, 18, 19, 20. What do you There it is, that brilliant flash, that white light that precedes the explosion of the atomic bomb number 17. 40 miles away, a brilliant white flash, almost blinding with those rocket trails coming out of it. The fire is dying now. It's turning to a dull red, not quite the brilliant orange and purple and green of past atomic bombs, but a beautiful sight. The typical funnel shape rising into that giant mushroom cloud and now blossoming out like a big ball of... As the 40s became the 50s, KTLA's remote news units became as familiar as police and fire units at the scene of news stories. And for Los Angeles TV viewers, it became a habit to tune in Channel 5 whenever a major news story broke. For Klaus Landsberg, the dream had come true. I think it might interest our audience which is uh, watching this telecast from Los Angeles, that uh, perfect reception was enjoyed uh, of this atomic explosion all through the country. We had a report from the uh, telephone company uh, that fed the picture from Los Angeles to where we brought it uh, all the way across the country. That reception was perfect all the way through, and we're delighted about it, of course. But all too soon, the dreamer will dream no more. On September 16, 1956, Klaus Landsberg died of cancer. His contributions were enough to fill the long lifetime of an outstanding individual. When Klaus died, he was 40 years old. One can only wonder at what might have been. One of Klaus Landsberg's two sons, Cleve, a television producer remembers. I remember being taken one night down to a city at night. It was at Knott's Berry Farm. And my dad was brought to direct the show in an ambulance. He was in the hospital with one of his many cam uh, cancer operations. And he was there, and I was there to see him, and he directed the show, and after the show was over, back in the ambulance and back to the hospital. Uh, that always stuck out in my mind.